Uh, I now look to Catherine Lasky to close the case for the proposition. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, distinguished guests. I'd like to begin with a question. Isn't it the nature of humanity to seek what is best for ourselves? The impulse is indeed a vital part of our humanity. We are not merely supine victims of fate who surrender unquestioningly to a will not our own. There is an almost biological manifest destiny in resisting nature's pull toward the imperfect, the random. And therefore, we are tempted to go forth to shape our own lives, utilizing the newfound tools of genetic engineers. But then again, we must realize how easy it is to slide into the dark shadows of eugenics. James Watson himself once proclaimed that if you are really stupid, I would call that a disease. So when does genetic engineering turn from eliminating debilitating diseases to seeking something better than merely healthy? What happens when the inherent randomness of procreation is usurped and driven by an obsessive perfection to create genetically enhanced athletes or flawless children. The hubris here is mind-boggling. I would argue that we are skidding toward a fatal narcissism on this slippery slope. Suppose this perfectly designed child walks into a school with an AK-47 and murders 17 children. It's not that the careful design of the brain has been violated in some way to bend toward violence. It is rather that there are other influences that could cause these tragic glitzes that are beyond the elegant editing of CRISPR tools. Working on brain DNA with CRISPR is like a repairman in the Victorian age trying to fix a bug in your Mac by pulling out his best set of tweezers. <laughs> But it's not the glitches that frighten me. It's the evolution of this addiction toward perfection. In the preamble of the uh, American Constitution, we say that our intention was to form a more perfect union, union, and among other things, to ensure domestic tranquility. Hence, we pass the Second Amendment, protecting the right to bear arms. Would the American Founding Fathers have written the amendment had they seen over the barrel of their muskets an AK-47 at the bottom of this slippery slope? This analogy is flawed. It's not perfect, as I might wish. But I am not a debater. I actually thought when the email with the invitation arrived that, dare I say, it was fake news. <laughs> Driven by a pathological honesty, I felt compelled to write back, confessing that I was slightly alarmed by the invitation, as I am not a scientist, but a children's book author, possibly best known for my animal fantasy books. <laughs> but I had almost 20 years ago written a novel for young adults called Star Split, about a future society that practiced genetic engineering. It took me a while to process all this when I got the invitation. It was rather like, oh yeah, that book. Now what was the main character's name? <laughs> That's product of an ungenetically enhanced brain. <laughs> the point on which the plot turns in Star Split is when the protagonist accidentally meets her clone. That dilemma of the novel ignited my imagination. What happens when you meet yourself? Which girl is the authentic self? This drive to perfection is what unnerves me. This is our sword in the stone, our silver chalice. It glitters, it's gorgeous. But with all this perfection, as a children's book author, I am fearful. What could be more boring 
than writing constantly about characters who are flawless. Where's the angst? Where's the rebellion, the tragic flaw that drives the narrative? Perfection kills empathy. My fascination with genetic engineering began with Dolly the Sheep. That was when I decided to write the novel. It seemed ironic that my invitation from Oxford came the same week as the announcement that Barbara Streisand had cloned her dog, Samantha, <laughs> a coton de Tulier. The T New York Times reported that Miss Streisand was so distraught that the cloning might not work that she went out and adopted a rescue dog. The breed was a Maltipu that she named Sadie. But the cloning worked, and she was blessed with two Coton de Tuliers. To make a long story short, Miss Streisand gave away Sadie. There is a fetching uh, photograph of the, two of, the, uh, of the two little clones, Miss Scarlet and Miss Violet, being wheeled in a baby carriage by the grave of Miss Streisand's late dog, Samantha. One of the dogs seems attentive, as if reading the inscription on the gravestone. The other appears to be shrinking down in the carriage, hiding. However, Miss Streisand, in a deeply philosophical moment, says, you can clone the look of a dog, but you can't clone the soul. Now, as an author of children's books, I see an opening here for a book. I, of course, immediately identified with Sadie, the rescue dog who was cast out of the Streisand household when the two cloned interlopers arrived. In my imagination, Sadie is sent to a decidedly less upscale neighborhood. In the narrative, Sadie turns out to be just fine, but the two clones turn out to be serial killers. <laughs> yes, they get hold of an AK-47 and cut a swath across America, much like Bonnie and Clyde. No AK-47s there, but a Winchester lever-action shotgun and some Colt automatic pistols. The two Tuliers, that's hard to say, are of, of course soulless. So getting back to the matter of souls. Before there was Dolly or Miss Scarlet and Miss Violet, there was a little critter just two blocks from our home in Cambridge, the other Cambridge in Massachusetts, in the bio labs of Harvard. This mouse was never given a name, as far as I know, but was simply called the Harvard mouse. It was a transgenic mouse embryo into which foreign DNA had been introduced and successfully incorporated into one of its chromosomes. This was regarded with great wonder. The mouse was a kind of living crystal ball for cancer research. But we felt a little bit nauseous, perhaps, when pictures appeared of the mouse with an ear growing out of its back. Then again, what did it matter? If a mouse is lacking a soul, was it a monstrosity to itself? If you extrapolate, could we ourselves, our unenhanced selves, become monstrosities in society that pursues perfection? I do believe that genetic engineering subverts our moral landscape. To reference Michael Sandel, yet again, it could turn us into a gated community where only the perfect lived. And this, Sandel argues, would transform three key features of our humanity. Humility, responsibility, and solidarity. For humility would be replaced by hubris, responsibility of succeeding on one's own, transferred to engineering, and solidarity eroded by the ghosts of eugenics. Stephen Jay Gould, that great celebrant of randomness, calls our species the glorious accidents of an unpredictable process with no drive to complexity. In conclusion, let us begin to understand that genetic engineering destroys that randomness that is the very root of our humanity. Thank you so much. <laughs>